It's time for the BallQuest Mailbag Podcast, answering your questions from the General's Quarters every week, right here on BallQuest. Good Thursday, everybody, and welcome into the BallQuest Mailbag Podcast. I'm Eric Kane with the crew, Rob Lewis, Brett Hubbs, Austin Price, and a big thanks to East Tennessee's most trusted health and wellness store, focusing on natural products and organic remedies to a variety of elements. Of course, that is Smoky Mountain Organics. And listen, if you're suffering from the spring allergies, like so many of us are this time of the year with all the pollen, check out Smoky Mountain Organics and to see what they have to offer. They have three locations located right here at East Tennessee, including a location in Knoxville at 8018 Kingston Pike across from the Trader Joe's. And you can buy online at their website. That's Smoky Mountain Organics. Dot com. A lot in store here today on this mailbag edition. We got basketball questions, of course, football recruiting questions, uh, bigger picture questions around the SEC. We'll go ahead and dive down into it. And awesome price, you're up, man. Uh, could we potentially land three IMG five stars with Mpemba, uh, Maguoa, the five star offensive tackle, and Carnell Tate? Of course, this is from Garantano Survivor asking about these IMG players. One of the uh, best screen names on the site, by the way. Can, and when are they going to get a John? When are they going to get a John Smith AP at, at can, IMG? Kane, 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 really, he kept it out of the ditch there when he, when he brought it back at the end and gave the guys handle. Had he not <laughs> give the handle, he could have been the, given the quick hook. I am learning on the fly, baby. <laughs> we would have went with the lefty for the rest of the podcast. Um, oh man, Kane, I, I just. I don't think that they're going to land three from IMG. I think they can land two. Uh, you know, the, the defensive lineman who's originally from Missouri, um, you know, that one, I think he's coming in in a couple of weeks. I think that's just to kind of see what Tennessee has to offer. Again, you can't ever say never, but I just think that's probably a little bit unrealistic. I think if they could land Francis and Carnell, that would be awesome for Tennessee's recruiting. I think it'd be huge anytime you can land multiple guys from IMG and wishful thinking would be all three, but certainly trying to make a good impression with the tackle this weekend. Of course, you're in it with Carnell Tate and see what comes of it of Mpemba. Am I saying that right? Mpemba? I I didn't know how to say that one. Like, yeah, that's what I've been going with here this week. Uh, Sam Smith, 2233. We'll go with you, Brent, on this one. The report from SI that the SEC is down to two scheduling for the formats. Which one do you prefer? Uh, the eight game with the one permanent, seven rotating, or the nine game uh, with the three permanent and six rotating? Uh, don't you think that's going to end up being a nine game, Rob? I mean, when it's all said and done, ju- just for this TV contract that is billion, a billion dollars or whatever, I, I just think ultimately – that 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 thing's going to end up being a nine game schedule w- when it's all said and done. Now the question's going to be, you know, what's this three and six? I mean, is that your pods? I mean, you know, what what are all those games a part of? But I think the bigger question right now, they're going to play an eight game schedule or a nine game schedule. And, and I think with home and home series getting harder to schedule, um, I, I just think that that this conference is going to end up with a nine game schedule because I think there's more money involved in in it for them. That's my thought. Yeah, I agree, Hubbard. I mean, I don't see how you can add teams and you know, grow the conference and not expand the schedule. When even before you added two teams, you know, there was a lot of you know, clamoring that you add that you add a game to the conference schedule. And when you when you bring in two more teams, I mean, it's already unbalanced, as AP loves to point out. All that I mean, the, the schedule is already not fair for every. You know, when you play Alabama every year, somebody plays. AP, who's South Carolina got? Help me out. Play Texas A&M. There you go. As their permanent opponent. As I, I don't see how you don't head things in that direction. And Hubbard, you, you mentioned it. I mean, even, even if it wasn't for the extra teams, the extra money. I mean, who do you think the, the ESPN wants? Well. You know, a, another SEC game or Tennessee playing BYU. Well, and, and going off Hubs' theory of nine and going the three-six method, that means you are going pods. Your three, your three, your, your four, fourteen pod. You have that I means you have three permanent opponents, and then you have six that rotate. In my opinion, and so um, I, I just think it de- it definitely changes, like you know, kind of the expectations at every school, though. Because I mean, like if you think about it, I mean, not every school. I mean, you know, like South Carolina has Clemson, you know. I mean, but like 
realistically on, on, a, on a normal year, Tennessee should have four, you know, four winnable games in the non-conference. Um, and so, like, getting four easier wins um, is fairly easy. So, thus getting the six wins becomes – Pretty much, you know, I mean, you can win two conference games, right? In most in most years. Um, but at the same time, you know, you know, you're just talking about taking that one of those away and then all of a sudden just three, you're not scheduling anybody hard out of conference. Would you would you schedule it? Would you schedule the Pittsburgh if you had to play nine conference games over? No. I, I mean I don't and I, and I again, but I think those games are getting harder and harder to schedule. And I think you've got some teams in this conference that don't schedule those types of games. So what you becomes know, of like Nebraska? Like I mean, we're talking about this Washington game that they just booked, but I mean, like somebody will sign up for that if they got to play nine conference games. Well, I mean, you know, who, who knows? I mean, that one's way on down the line. But but I mean, again, I, I just think with the money involved there, they're going to end up with with nine um, when it's all said and done. I, I think the only thing that's a challenge to it is. Is anybody going to stand on the table and, and really fight for their, keeping some of those traditional rival games, those 100-year games, the, 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 the Auburn Georgias, the Tennessee Alabamas, you know. Um, Florida Georgia. Yeah, some of these really – some of these real traditional games that are played every year that are that would now not be played every year. Is somebody going to stand on the table and say, hey, we, we've got to protect those – we've got to protect those games? Or is this conference at a point of – modernization where they go, you know what, we're going to pot it up and we're going to rotate the other six and you'll play them once every six years. No, I think AP's generation is about to win, however. <laughs> well, in this nine game model too, it protects against that because Tennessee can still play Vanderbilt every year. Tennessee can still play Alabama. Every Alabama. Year. If the SEC chooses to do it that way, if you go to the seven rotating and one permanent, it likely be Tennessee and Vanderbilt. And also one more thing on this, a problem with the nine game one year, you have five, SEC home games the other year you have four and it rotates back and forth like that whereas the other one would be split four and four uh one more thing from Sam Smith Rob uh scouting report on Cade Phillips yeah I mean he's kind of a modern day stretch four I mean kind of I mean and I'm not an expert on him with COVID and everything I haven't seen as many of these kids as I would normally see so I'm I'm relying on some secondhand information people tell me he's a stretch four he shoots it well he you know like most 17 year old kids who are six foot eight he, he needs to add some weight i mean he needs, to, he needs his strength needs to catch up with his length um real handy player um pretty good athlete obviously comes from some has some great genes in his family his mom played basketball in alabama his dad was was a quarterback at alabama um and hubbard and i are so old that uh we we, we covered his dad's recruitment Yes, um, yeah, yes, we did. And and because of that, Rob, how is that one not a lay down to Alabama? How is that not a lay down for Nate Oates? I I don't think Alabama has recruited him nearly as hard as Tennessee. Okay. I, mean, I, th- I think it probably could have been a lay down had had they come after him as hard. Tennessee identified this kid coming out of last summer as, as somebody that they were they were pushing all their chips in the middle of the table on. And um I don't think Alabama has approached it with nearly the, the same the same vigor, the same aggression. And, um, but, but for me, I mean, he's a six, eight kid that, that can shoot it and he's, needs to get stronger. He needs to get better inside, but it, with his, his skill set, this is a guy that, you know, I think if he's in Rick Barnes's program it, it is a guy that really has a chance to, to develop into a very nice player. So what you're telling me is he's not Antonio Davis, Dell Davis or Buck Williams. No. Okay. Gotcha. This was Kane doesn't know who any of those guys are. I don't. I'm not going to lie to you. I do not. Does Kane know who John Kaler is? <laughs> John, hey, do you know who John Concack is, Kane? I, I do not know. John Kaler is from Talbot, Kane. <laughs> hey, come on. He, hey, Kane's, come, hey, Kane's coming real close to getting the hook here, boys. I mean, we, from, we, we got some people warming up in the pen, Kane. You got to get this hey, thing on the rails, least, brother. At, at least I pronounced it correctly. It's Talbot, not Talbot. Uh, recruiting oh, momentum trying to save some face. <laughs> is is it feeling real with the recruiting momentum or is it just juice because we are hip right now from Corrington Vol 17 AP you can you can answer this one it, it, I think they kind of work hand in hand I mean Tennessee has got juice because they are kind of hip right now but there is legitimate recruiting momentum because Tennessee can legitimately land Francis they can legitimately land uh Carnell Tate they can legitimately land 
Christian Conyers. They can legitimately land, uh, you know, a Rico Walker or uh, Tyree Weathersby or Sean Davion Bradley or, you know, John Slaw. I mean, like Tennessee has got legitimate recruiting momentum, and it's because they have juice, because they have become cool because of one guy, the guy that likes to wear glasses, Nico Iamaliava. And pajama pants. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, again, huge weekend coming up this weekend. Rob, back to you. Should we be worried about Jonas Adu potentially transferring after this year if Uros gets the starting spot again this year? That's from UT Basketball Enthusiast 12. I'm going to say no, but I'm also not worried about the sun not coming up on <laughs> December 17th. Dale, 1998. Brent, this one's for you. In your interview with Danny White, he said, we are scheduled out through 2032. When, when will some of these games be announced? We only have one opponent announced for 2027 through 2030 and none for 31 or 32. Yeah, I don't think he was talking about, I think he was talking about the specifics of the kind of the big name games, some of the home and home stuff, you know, being announced when talking about playing neutral sites. Uh, that was kind of in his response to the neutral site question. I don't think you're going to see Tennessee playing, um, neutral site games against non power five opponents if they play neutral site games. Uh, so I think that's more what he's talking about. The other thing too is you, you got to figure out what your schedule plan is in the sec before you can f- complete out the, the, you know, your entire non-conference schedule, What which we just talked about it earlier. Are they going, you know, how many conference games are they going? What does that look like? Uh, because that is going to affect what your scheduling looks like. Um, and, and so I don't know when anything's going to get announced, but I, I don't expect anything to be completely finalized with the schedule. I think there's probably some handshake type stuff that they're, that they have, but I don't think anything's pinned to paper until we see exactly what this league's going to look like after expansion. Awesome price. In your opinion, will Spire open other satellite offices around the Southeast, specifically targeting uh, traditionally rich recruiting areas, such as Atlanta, Charlotte, um, and other spots like that? No. Okay. Bonus question, Austin. Big Mac or Whopper? Neither for you, right? Big Mac. No way. Well, you get a Big Mac with two with two patties and three pieces of bread. Sure. Hover, okay. Hover here's the Jeez. tragedy. Jeez. You, He's getting Hover, the fries. You, you reminded me of what this is one of the biggest, like I, I don't know the uh, unspoken Volquest controversies when traveling on the road with AP. And Hubbard, if you're trying to get AP to stop it at Arby's, I'll go to Arby's. Every time I've stopped I'm, with AP, it's not I, I, Arby's is now Arby's is now serving a hamburger, Rob, <laughs> <laughs> and crinkle cut fries. Much to Hubbard's dismay. Don't get me started on the daggum lack of potato cakes. <laughs> Don't get me started on that. That's not a that's not a question. In this mailbag podcast, but I can do thirty minutes on the tragedy of the loss of the potato cake by hey, Arby's. Hey, they have pre, 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 they have premium boneless wings at Arby's too, Hubs. <laughs> Those are called chicken nuggets. Don't get me started on that either. <laughs> Taco Bell did bring back the Mexican pizza while we're in the fast food quarter. It'll be gone soon. Don't <laughs> worry. Everybody will complain about it. Rob, back to you. Uh, the Washington State basketball player, I'm not even going to attempt to uh, pronounce his name, but uh, does he? Does Tennessee have a chance of getting him if he comes back from the draft? And then secondly, the 2023 basketball recruiting board looking like past Justin Edwards, Aiden Holloway, and Cade Phillips. Uh Man, that's a great question. Um, let me throw one name out there that I just got this week that I was trying to say for the war room. Uh, Freddie Dillone is a guy that I think will be in here for an official visit. Um, probably, I want to say, I think the summer, probably June. Man, Justin Edwards is, is the guy, though. I mean, Tennessee all in on, on Justin Edwards. And I, I'm not going to – when you're talking about a five-star kid, you know, with – everybody chasing chasing him like that like he's chasing that kid then uh that's not a lay down by any means but uh just at the top of the board in a big way and i think you know we talked a lot about jared or not not recently but previously we talked a lot about um jared hall from lebanon i think if things go tennessee's way with kate Kate phillips this weekend um I, i would say the vols probably move on from um hall who's a really nice player, but a uh, kind of similar position to, um, to Kate Phillips. Hey, Rob, with, with COVID now over and, and back out on the road, I mean, how's, 
typically the evaluation process is, you know, you're evaluating kids that are eighth, ninth, 10th graders. Is there going to be kind of a later evaluation for some kids, you think, for another year or so to catch up? Or do you think everybody's caught up from not being able to go out and evaluate and not having that summer AAU series the way they did with COVID? Yeah, I think people are mostly caught up, Barbara. I, I wouldn't say, I mean, I would, I would still say there are some guys that have slipped through the cracks, and, you know, haven't been, that are going to be seniors next year or maybe going to be juniors in some cases that haven't been seen as much as they would have. But I, I don't think you're having, you know, I don't think there's a lot of Zakai Zieglers out there this year that are going to pop up on the radar. But I mean, I, again, I, I would say there are probably still a few of those type guys, but not like there would have been last summer and especially not the summer before. Rob, Rob how, how does monkeypox affect the evaluation? <laughs> I've, not, I've not heard that pop up yet as a concern. Hey, people hit a couple of recruiting ones rapid fire here. Um, do you think Ramon Jefferson could get some real work in here this season for the sole fact that he would assume he understands how to pass block has to commit to us first, of course. Um, what do you got on that one? Yes, I think that he could get some work in Tennessee this fall. It is starting to seem that the Vic Burley ship is starting to sail no matter what happens this weekend. Do you feel that way? Um, no, because recruiting's, recruiting is recruiting. So, like, there have been plenty of times where Tennessee had a kid done and lost him or they had no shot whatsoever and ended up getting the kid. And Big so, time. so like, it, you know, until the, until the kid signs, no, no ship has truly sailed. It may, it may be floating out there in the water, but yeah. it, it's not left. It's not left the immediate area. Got a big time weekend coming up for a local prospect in Deshaun Bishop. Uh, will this weekend determine if the staff decides to truly go all in on him? I, I would assume that's a yes. I will go yes there. I, I think this weekend is big for him, you know, um, to get over there and hang out and spend time. I mean, you know, Deshaun, Deshaun's a different personality, you know, um, he kind of, plays with a you know kind of an anger and a and a burning you know chip on his shoulder um you know i think that kind of lives out in just kind of his natural personality i mean he's not a big talker and so i think being able to get over there and just kind of hang out around other players and maybe getting somebody to pull pull him out of his shell a little bit would be good and then finally of course these are all from athron um how many guys do you think tennessee is set up to potentially land over the months of June and July. The over under is set at three and a half. If you put in both of those months, I would take the I'll over. I'll go over. Yeah. Yeah. At three and a half. Brent Hubbs, this is a good one for you right here from Megaball 98. With the NCAA getting rid of the 25 scholarship cap for recruiting, will Tennessee try to sign more players than usual to fill out the roster? Oh, I think roster management with the NCAA putting that waiver in is going to be fascinating for all schools out there because right now what you're looking at is. Um, you know, you're going to cut guys. You're going to encourage guys to to leave. Yeah, you are. And, and clean up, <laughs> clean up your roster, and get rid of get rid of quote dead weight guys who aren't contributors, uh, and then go out and sign more high school, you know, more kids. Uh, whether it's a transfer, I mean, you guys still play under the 85, but um, it, it's easy to do that when when you make room and get rid of some kids. Re remember this too, for fans, it's all the grass is always greener with the next guy. Right. I mean, the, the next guy is going to be the great one. Right. I mean, it, it, it's that's why fans love recruiting, because it's all about the yeah. potential. Coaches get into that a little bit, too. They, they don't always have the greatest amount of patience that, OK, you know, a year into this thing, this guy's not good enough. Instead of waiting to see if he develops into a player his third or fourth year, you're moving on. So I, I think around the country, what you would what you would see is you would see a lot more roster movement by coaches because this gives them an opportunity to um, get rid of some guys who they don't feel like are going to be, you know, contributors or real contributors to the program. That's how I see it. And of course, this is in play for the next two years right now. Um, but I tell you, who, I tell you who it helps. Not not to not to interrupt. It helps anybody in a transition with a coaching change. Yep. Think oh, about yeah. where Josh Heupel would have been had this been in place for him last spring after 30 guys go into the transfer portal and Tennessee's where they are at that point, or think about somebody coming into it versus somebody coming into a job this year, Brian Kelly, for example, how many guys did they lose at LSU to be under the 85. Okay. Could they get back to 85 with just 25 signings in his class? Probably not. Let's go. I mean, now you take a 25, you take a seven transfers, you might take 30 and seven transfers. 
you can flip your roster a lot quicker over the course of the next two years based on this rule. And since you can run them off, I guess it is not as big of a deal, but how many, I mean, how much dead weight are some guys going to sign in, in the scenarios you're talking about, Hubbard, where they're under pressure to flip their roster and they sign, you know, like how many, how many, how many guys did Jeremy bring in that first year that, you know, to take, so you're, you're saying you could, <laughs> yeah, I wish, I wish could people, pick. I wish people could see AP space. <laughs> I mean, I, I remember the time Jesse and I were like, they are just taking slappings, you know. I mean, like, there's so many guys they just added late, but th- there was also Cedric Tillman. You know what I'm saying? Like, that one, right. For every, for every Brandon Davis, there was a Cedric Tillman. Or a Madre London. Who was playing in the USFL? I saw him play the other night, actually, out the skinning the channels. You know, so like, I, I do think, you know, to, to, to go back to Hubbard's point, I think for somebody like Auburn, who's most likely going to make a coaching change at the end of this year, I think we all agree on that, mm-hmm. you know, unless, you know, he somehow pulls a rabbit out of his hat um, in, in the SEC West with a depleted roster, whoever they hire is going to have a chance to flip the roster and, and not tumble as far as you normally would. Football Fanatic 09 has a basketball question, Rob. Uh, question is, what is the ceiling at UT for Zakai Ziegler? Does he have what it takes to be the top scorer on this team down the road, first team all SEC, or is he kind of just a contribute in ways that we saw last season, making the hustle and the determination uh, type plays for this guy? What's his ceiling? But I think he could be an all SEC player. I mean, he came in, you know, last year as a freshman. And um, I mean, off the top of my head, I can't remember what he's scoring average for the, for the season was, but he was a, a double-digit scorer in SEC play. I mean, pretty reliably. He was the fourth leading scorer of the team. Um, shot almost 40% from three-point range. Yeah, I mean, I think he's like, I can, can totally be an all-SEC player. I mean, no doubt in my mind. I mean, I'm not predicting it necessarily right now, but I don't think that's a stretch at, at all to think that he could be one of the eight guys – on an all-SEC team. A couple more football ones here. We'll go uh, back to AP. What's the word on the Sam Houston State running back? Is Tennessee going to go after the offensive lineman uh, from Oklahoma that entered the portal, Daryl Simpson? And where is your dream place to golf outside of Augusta? Ramon, oh, God. Ramon, was, go ahead. Ramon Jefferson, we've already talked about him. I expect him to be here. Um uh, the Oklahoma kid, I've not heard anything about him as far as Tennessee's going after him. Plus, I mean, that kid's a 17. So, I mean, he technically was in Jarrett. Well, no, he wasn't Jared Garantano's class. He was a 16. So, the year after JG. Uh, but, I mean, he's been around a while. Um, and then outside of that, the Northeast, man. I mean, like, there's top 100 golf courses on every corner of there. Like, there are Starbucks or, or, or Dunkin' Donuts. I mean, just in the New York, New Jersey area. And nobody wants to hear me going on this, but it's I, – I, plus, I love the, the different types of grasses up there. By the way, he really misses Oscars and Lost Creek, most of all. Lost Creek. What I'm, more, I'm more proud that, that Hubs threw out Oscars. Oscars is still there. Is it really? Is yeah. it really? Yeah. I didn't know Oscars was still, was still going. Yeah, that's the Morristown Country Club. UT Sportsman 16, Brent, uh, I want to know about the staff, the stability showing up in a positive way for defense this year. Basically, year two of the same system with the same coaches make up. Will that make up for some lack of depth and talent? I think the obvious answer there would be yes. I mean, the players have to step up, but you already have a little bit more depth than you felt like this time last year. A couple of guys stepping up in spring, but they still have work to do. But I think the answer there would be yes, Brent. Well, hell, it can't hurt that somebody's got the same coach for two consecutive yeah. for a second consecutive year. That's only happened a handful of times the last fifteen years on this campus. So, <laughs> um, I mean, it can't hurt. I mean, it has. It, you know, it has to be able to. I mean, it has the to. Four be wide to receivers, though, they had to change. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> so so all of a sudden now your defensive line's not learning a new personality, not learning a new strategy. Um, you know going to have the same coach, not only, you know, for the second consecutive season and, and maybe for an entire season, uh, unlike the a couple of years ago when they made changes in the middle of the season. So uh, I, I think it helps because you know the expectations, you know the language, uh, you know what a coach means when he says something, whereas you spent the, you know, the first year trying to figure it out. You know, well, why, is, you know why is this guy yelling at me? What's he looking for that I'm not doing? What does he necessarily mean by this? 
now you know. And, and I think that allows you to further develop. I, I think that's, you know, at the end of the day in basketball, Rick Barnes has had a lot of assistants come through. And those assistants he lets coach. If anybody's ever been to a practice, he lets them coach a lot. But but they're all – it's what Rick Barnes wants. Everybody knows on the practice floor what Rick Barnes is looking for and, and the expectation there. And I think that further help. I mean, I think that absolutely helps development. So, yes, I think it should help the defense that everybody's back. Well, let's stay with you on this one, and you might not have anything on this, but Trek uh, hired a, a new coach. Uh, any nuggets you care to share about the roughly one-day search for – the replacement for the UT track and field team. This is from volunteered 87. Yeah, that was, that cert, that coaching search felt like that uh, somebody going in the portal who already knew what they were, where yep. they were going when they went into the portal. Danny White knew exactly what he, what direction he was going uh, when that change was made. That's to my understanding, um, heavy focus on sprinters, which I think is something that Tennessee fans want to hear because you look at the tradition of this track and field program through the years, it's been based on sprinters. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the Sam Grady's, the Willie Galt's, the, the, the Gatlin's, um, all mm. those guys, you know, all those guys that have come through and, and been the game changers for, for the track and field program. It's been in the sprinter world. So I think getting back to focusing on sprinters is, has been a priority. Um, I, I know that, that there's a lot of people in the track and field community who feel like this guy's a builder. He knows what it takes to, to build up a program with some stability. So, uh, we'll see. Um, you know, interesting in track. Does 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 NIL factor in there? How do you how do you deal with that for guys looking to turn pro and uh, all the things that are out there for those guys? That, that's an interesting dynamic in, in the track and field world that will never really get talked about. But there's some different things to try to compete against some of that stuff uh, that that track coaches have had to deal with for for the last few years. So you, so what you're telling me is Danny White did not get on a plane, go to Columbus, down to Dallas, back up to to North Carolina, back to California to meet anybody. I, I did not, he turned, and turned his cell phone off. I did not get – yeah, he, he, he was not on a plane without cell service. Um, and I did not get a picture of Danny White walking through uh, the Charlotte, Charlotte Airport. Airport terminal on, on getting on a flight <laughs> to go somewhere. Was he at Island Home? I don't, I don't think he left. I'm not sure he left Knoxville for the for the search. That it 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 clearly appears that he dialed the area code in seven digits and said, "Hey, um, won't you be here tomorrow about ten o'clock? Let's do this thing." AP was still working on the hot board. The hire was the hire was up. <laughs> hey, you ready to roll? Come on down. Uh, just a couple more guys. One more from Volunteer at 87. Uh, Jackie, you want her cursey on there? <laughs> this is for all you guys. Rob, we'll start with you. And whoever else wants to chime in, Carl Lewis. Do you guys? He, he sings a mean national anthem. <laughs> do you guys talk to other teams' writers within the rivals network? I know I do. I'm sure you guys do as well. When collaborating about a guy in the transfer portal or a prospect, and in terms of now, there are some you know sites that will work with you more than other. I mean, I found out found that out in my couple of years. But I'm sure you guys do that as well. I yes. talk. To, I, I talk to writers of all networks. Yes, my answer is yes. AP. Absolutely. Percent, yeah, I'll figure that as a yes across the board. Percent chance that Tennessee lands Francis or Lucas Simmons. So I guess give a percent chance for, you know, I'll both go, of those guys. This is like playing the Price is Right game. I, you know? I'll go, I'll go, I, I'm not going to give percentages. Come on, I, What I will do is I'll say I think they 62. have a better shot. I think they have a better shot at landing Francis than Lucas Simmons. And I'm not saying they don't have a shot at landing Lucas Simmons. So, so you're saying 51% on Francis and 49 on Lucas? Is that where you're yep, at? There you go. Perfect. All right. Perfect. There we go. Brent, what does Heibel need to change in <laughs> it's year like, two? It's like, bidding one, it's like bidding $1 when you're the last person to bid on the Price is Right. You had a lot and of And everybody's yeah. overbid. Go ahead. Sorry, Kane. What does Heibel need to change in year two in his offense to improve it? Just off the top of my head, a couple of things. The short yardage play calling was, was huge for me. Short yardage situations. Um, you know, get, getting more creative in terms of the playbook in certain areas of the field. But what are some things you have in terms of the offense in year two? Well, I think I think the fascinating thing is what is the counter going to be by defenses after seeing it for a year? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody does their self-scouts and their self-studies all summer long. You can't tell me that that this offense of Josh Heupel's is not at the, at the, pro, at the top of the list for every defensive coordinator in this league to be studying. I mean, look. Tennessee didn't finish it in the red zone. They moved the ball as well as anybody against Georgia this past year. Uh, they obviously had moments where they lit people up 
and, and and scored, and they had other moments where they moved the ball but didn't finish. So what's defense's counters to him, and what's Josh Heupel's counter to some of the defensive stuff that they see? I, you know, obviously it's short yardage. They've got to run the ball better, be more physical there. That's been talked about. I've written about it. Everybody's discussed that. How, how does, the, you know, Hendon Hooker's legs factor into short yardage stuff? I wonder if they don't use the middle of the football field a little bit more as mm-hmm. well. Um I think if Jalen Hyatt is going to be in the slot and jump on in here, guys, but if he's going to be the slot receiver, he's a different type slot receiver than Valus Jones because of his long stride. I think he can stretch the middle of the field vertically more than Valus could. Um, So how do they use the slot position with a different type receiver than what they had a year ago? I think that could be an interesting uh, nuance to this offense this fall. He's not going to break as many tackles, though, either. I mean, no. but people just bounced off Bayless. Uh, well, and, you know, Bayless could catch the five-yard out, and it could turn it into a, a, a 50-yard gain. I don't think Jalen's going to do that. Um, but I think Jalen can run a post and get behind somebody better than Bayless probably could. Or sure. at least we thought he could. Now, maybe that's not the case, but we'll see. I, I just think with his long legs and height, vertically in the middle of the field would seem to be a bigger factor with him than it would be Bayless Jones. I agree. All right, we'll end on this one. Uh, this is from Ball for Live, a three seven six four three. A note to Austin: You asked where he was last week, or last where he was last week. Born in Johnson City, lived in Elizabethan. He says his nephew is a star for the Cyclones football team, living in Bristol, Tennessee. But the question is, and this is for everybody, and I have not mentioned his name one time until now, Brent. So don't fire me. Celebrity death match: Who you got? Jumbo versus Nikki. I don't know. I, I, I mean, may, maybe they can just beat each other to a pulp, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean um, Nick probably brings more arm guards. So Nick probably has more help. So it becomes a tag team match or a, a relay match, if you will. How about that? Pretty weak answer, AP. What do you got? Yeah, I mean, I, I, how I would venture to say that goes is, is, is Jimbo – openly pulls out any kind of weapons and then Nick, Nick, Nick does it behind the scenes with, you know, cause he doesn't want anybody to see. I mean, if we're just we're going off recruiting, you know, Jimbo's more blatant, Nick's more sneaky. And Rob, some people would say Nick would have, uh, Nick would have the officiating helping him out as well. Right. <laughs> uh, Jim, I, all I know is Jimbo had better get a knockout because you don't want the scorecard to go to the league office. <laughs> I don't think I want to take on Nick Saban in anything because he'd find a way. All right, that'll do it here for this edition of the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast. Uh, big thanks to everybody who wrote into us every single Thursday. Uh, we'll get it here at VolQuest.com. And big thanks to Smoky Mountain Organics, each and every uh, VolQuest podcast brought to you by Smoky Mountain Organics. Go ahead and visit one of the three locations in East Tennessee, including the location in Knoxville at 8018 Kingston Pike across the street from the Trader Joe's. Gentlemen, big weekend coming up, Tennessee recruiting, Tennessee baseball in the SEC tournaments, loads of that, plus the War Room coming up later tomorrow, more or later tonight, I guess, tomorrow morning. All that you have to look forward to on the website, the front page, and the general quarters at VolQuest.com. For Brent Hubs, Austin Price, and Rob Lewis, I'm Eric Kane. Appreciate you guys listening here to the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast. You've been listening to the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast every week right here on VolQuest.